Today I'm here with the fantastic Dane Buckley. Uh, Dane, is, Dane is the world's only Irish, Indian, uh, gay comedian, possibly. He's a support act for one of the top UK comedians, Tom Allen. You can find Dane online at Dane Comedian. How are you, Dane? Uh, Tommy Gawano or August Tommy Gawano. Oh, Dan, don't put me in shame already. Speak it Irish. <laughs> Tommy Grand. I look. <laughs> I saw the fear in your eyes there. I, <laughs> uh, I'm very good. I'm really well. Yeah. yeah. What did you say in Irish? Because I said highlighted. I'm very good. I'm fantastic. In fact, Gawano. Yeah. Well, we've established for everyone that I am, in fact, a fake <laughs> Irish man. I've identified <laughs> as Irish, but it is not true. Uh, so, Dan. We met at an Irish networking event, yeah. um, and it was magical. It was a very nicely run event. Uh, you seem very in touch with your Irish roots. Um, yeah. What part has Ireland played in your life? Yeah, so I was just raised by my mom, obviously, and she's Irish. She's from County Cavan. Um, and growing up, she'd send me home to Ireland every summer because aunties are cheaper than babysitters, <laughs> basically. So I would do the tour, and I just completely fell in love with it. And then some summers I went to the Gael Talk, the Irish-speaking regions, and I love Irish music. So it's always been kind of there. And also like in social work and therapy, they talk about resilience. And I think Ireland was one of my resiliences. Just if I think back like to the music, to the language, to the culture, to the carry on, the humor, definitely. Like a lot of my comedy comes from my mum and just aunties and the crack that's had. So, and then I worked for the London Irish Centre for 10 years, the world's biggest Irish community centre. So it's had a massive, massive impact. So it really is in my veins i think how did you actually learn irish was it from someone from the Gwail talk so you go to like a summer school you do yeah. dancing and singing and cooking and walking and you're just you have teachers so i went to donegal glen colum kill and i absolutely loved it and of course if i speak irish it's not in an english accent so i could be like it's misha dean could you mail tati because and at some stage we're going to speak english and be like, oh, i have to let them know i'm english now <laughs> oh god but, um, and you know, I, I wasn't raised in Ireland. I'm sure if I was forced to speak at school, I might not love it. But because I come to it organically through songs and just conversations. Or if me and my mum were out and about and wanted to talk about someone, you know, she'd be like, a bochel. Like, look at the boy over there, you know. Wow. So I come to it naturally, which is probably why I like it. I didn't even know. I've been saying gil talk. I'm not even saying that correctly. I'm like guilt. No, you are. Sure. There's lots of different accents, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the nicest way I've ever heard it. <laughs> Embrace your culture, Reese. Embrace your culture. <laughs> um, you, in, a, in another podcast, you mentioned you did a three-month backpacking trip around Ireland. Like, what were some of the highlights and lowlights of that? Yeah, so basically when I come out, my mum said to me, which isn't the traditional way to do it, my mum said, go to Ireland for three months and backpack <laughs> around the West Coast. And I was like, is it safe? Of course it is. Hitchhike. And I was like, oh, is this bitch trying to get rid of me? <laughs> and I went to Ireland and I, I did hitchhike and I had an amazing time. I love folk music and two million Americans tour around Ireland in the summer. So there were lots of cool people. I had an amazing time. I met my best mate who I'm still best mates with now all this time later. Uh, and lots and lots of adventures. Spent nights locked out of hostels on beaches singing songs and um, yeah. Boat trip, stranded on the Aran Islands for a while. In terms of what you have to do if you go to Ireland, I personally think like Donegal, all the way down that coast, Sligo, Connemara, uh, Cork, Kerry, all the coast is is the best for me. And that's also where the Vikings and the English didn't get to. So I do kind of feel like they hold the culture more. I mean, the Aran Islands, made famous more recently because uh, the Banshees of Inish Aran was filmed there, are just gorgeous. And the thing is, they're sleepy and sweet and gorgeous and like a 5,000 year old Celtic ruin. All of that lovely, but they don't have any police. So at the same time, you've also got 100 Dublin girls on a Hindu. So it's also quite wild and fun. Mm -hmm. You know, I've definitely been drunk in a field, passed out and just slept under the stars. Woken up in the morning by like a wild goat, you know. <laughs> People are still telling stories of the mysterious yeah, day yeah. and you get the Englishman yeah, yeah. speak out. Remember the year the gay was here. <laughs> yeah. He just popped up in the field one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any specific like the go-to story from that trip like when you have to tell either a horror story or just a coming um, of age I, I do actually which is quite interesting like I remember at the time there weren't many gay clubs in Galway so that everyone just went to the main one and you had little if people were in the corner dancing particularly well you were like oh there's, there's the gays <laughs> <laughs> and I was so green I was 19 and I was I wasn't ever shy um, but I was I was a bit green, you know, I, I wasn't a big drinker. And I remember this girl saying, do you want some ecstasy? And I said, my mum said it's not good for you. And she said, do you do everything your mother says? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I remember going to the toilet at the cubicle 
saying a Hail Mary, this is how green I was because I really wanted a boyfriend, and then coming out and this lad said to me, can I buy you a drink? And I was like, I was so green, I was like, I have one actually. And he was like, no, no, I literally mean, can I buy you a drink, the act of buying a drink? And I was like, I had no idea. So essentially I went along with it and then that was my first date. So it really was, my mum was right. It really was about getting comfortable, speaking about who I am, just meeting different people. And I think being into the music is another way in, in Ireland, you know. They'd be, they were accepting of me in small little towns because I could knock out or should have a hawalia or a ballad mm. or something. So, so that, that um, is impressive anywhere to be fair. Like, yeah, again. I'm very orally gifted. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but it was special, and I'm so glad that I was an attention seeking person that kept a journal, obviously. Oh, you, you still have the journal? I still have the days? journal, and it's so cute. I mean, it's, it's so, I'm trying desperate to be prolific in it, you know, and you can't be that prolific at 19, but, but it's so cute to read, and I, it traces the, 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 it maps me being more comfortable with who I am and meeting my best friend and just singing sessions. And of course it's Ireland, so I bump into people that randomly I worked out I was related to and suddenly I'm I'm spending four nights in Mrs. Brown's house helping with the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm her second nephew twice removed, she says, <laughs> you know. Full story arc over the time, yeah, exactly. characters and everything. But also hitchhiking. I mean, I don't think it happens so much now, but that was, I got picked up by the Cadbury man and he said we can like have as much chocolate as we want. Guinness factory guy picked us up. We had like Guinness from the, the tankers. It was so good. Mother of four just picking us up in the back with the kids complaining we smelled garlic. So I completely misunderstood. I thought you were just like going from place to place on a bus or something, but no, you were no, full. No, hitchhiking. Well, just yeah, thumb up. Thumb up on the road and hoping. Hoping. Yeah, and I was like, I was six foot two. I was <laughs> six foot two dark man with an English accent and oily skin, but they were stopping. And so I loved it. And this was you and your best friend. You'd find her. But sometimes, then... sometimes I was doing it on my own. Sometimes I was doing it with my uh, another friend I'd met, a Danish girl who's six foot and blonde, which helped. To be fair, um, <laughs> but some days, yeah, it was just. I remember going to see Fang Fungi the Dolphin and Dingle, and it was just me and like a sweet granny stopping. You <laughs> know, lovely. Unbelievable. I mean, great stories were exchanged, and and yeah, a, that is that is a time I always look back to that was special because I don't think it could happen today. You know. It wouldn't. You'd be getting an Uber. Yeah, that's and TikToking I'm... some beautiful monument that you were looking <laughs> not, at. Not yeah. enjoying it at all. Yeah, it's not the same. So Tick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Tourist board Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> They've actually had some discovery Northern Ireland over. It's popping up in the cinema recently, and it looks oh, like yeah. a great place. I, <laughs> I haven't even been to the Giants Causeway yet, so <laughs> I need to go myself. <laughs> Um, so before, so obviously you've been having a lot of success in comedy, but before comedy, do you have like a favorite failure? Um, I do. And it is the dance. So I do sing. I would never wanted to be an actor, although I think I could lend myself to it. And people tell me like when I do impressions of my nan and stuff, they think I'm a good actor and stuff like that. But when I was really young, I really was just obsessed with dance. And although I am a larger lady, I am gifted in having like strong cavern thighs <laughs> Um, and I did some Irish dancing when I was young and like pop dancing in the playground and stuff like that. But I honestly wanted to be like a backing, Madonna's backing dancer. That was my dream. It didn't happen. Um, yet, but yet, yet yeah. exactly. But I can still hold my own in the club. <laughs> I can. I, can. <laughs> I could really do with some help. So uh, please. Uh, I'm not American work. I, <laughs> oh, I'm getting the. No need for that. Dude. Um, <laughs> I can't do a Russian dance, believe it or not. Can you? Yeah, it's my own. It's very inappropriate in almost every situation. People have asked me to stop many times, but I can't. I love that that's it. your party piece. Like, yeah. I, I could do a Russian dance. Like. <laughs> Yeah, it's not even a party because it's the only go to it, regardless of the the hype of the room. Like, Reese, you're in Nando's. What are you doing? Like, <laughs> have you sort of incorporated any dance into your comedy yet? I th yeah, I, I, there's a little, there's a high kick I do when I make a joke about being a triple threat, and um, <laughs> I make references because this is true. I was at Pineapple Studios once. I didn't know it was like a famous dance studios where Madonna and Kylie rehearse. I thought it was like a community center and they had like a, a well-being activity. So I went along not knowing it's like professional. Then bitches were on the bars with their leg warmers, stretching up their legs around their things. And here's me at the back looking like the figure eight. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and they had a, it was a mixed level class and they had a mirror. And I just remember being so different from everyone else. In the break, I run the fuck out of there. I was so absolutely mortified. And people come up to me and were like, did you mean to come here today or? And I was like, no, I didn't. I didn't have a clue what this was. So. Did you leave with like, I'm too good for you people? Like, obviously I have- No, I stole a towel class. and a headband. <laughs> <laughs> Got my money's worth. Well, I'm sorry to hear about the dance scene. I'm sure there's, <laughs> it's coming in the future for sure. Um, so can you just give the listeners some sort of context for the comedy? I'll, obviously I've given you your amazing introduction mentioning Tom Allen, but uh, how long have you been doing it and that sort yeah, of thing? Yeah, I've been doing it 15 months. Um, 
yeah, I, I wanted to do it. You know, when you have a dream and you keep putting it to bed, you're like, no, that's silly, that's silly, that's silly. That's scary. That's scary. And then, and then I thought, no, do you know what? I'm going to do it. And I signed up to a comedy course at the comedy store and then COVID happened. And so I kind of was at the gate there ready to run, but COVID happened and lockdown happened. And so that was, I felt I was really ready, but I couldn't. So then I started writing and what I would do was I would have an A4 page for every subject, like being half Indian, being half Irish, being from a council estate, um, being gay, a Catholic school, my nan, being fat, um, working in social work, adjacent, every every pay, miscellaneous, openers, closers, talking about a venue, dealing with a heckler. I would have all these subjects and each one, and the minute I got an idea, all of my friends for years, every time I said something funny, they said, write that down, write that down. And I would write it down then over lockdown and suddenly they were growing. And they started to form like a natural narrative. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about it in a minute, but my my master's was in writing. And actually, if you look at my five minutes, it goes where I come from, who my parents are, who I am, where I grew up, Catholic school, work, dating, how to get hold of me, goodbye, which is a very linear narrative. It's very story form. And that's how I started my first five minutes. Now, Obviously, if you're John from Watford and you're white British all the way, that's less interesting. <laughs> yeah, <by laughs> it might default. not be. You might be able to bring a different dynamic, but I've got, I'm lucky that I can tap into a few different identities. So let's just go back a bit and nerd out a little bit. So when you say you wrote everything down, were you like handwriting it on paper oh, God, or no, wo- no. Word? Com- yeah, uh, 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 Apple, yeah. Oh, oh Apple, nice. nice, nice I'm gay. So, yeah. <laughs> it has to be associated with Apple, but <laughs> so it was individual documents and Apple? Yeah, pages, yeah, pages. Word documents. And was yeah. there any sort of link between them or was it just like... That came later on once it got more and more because obviously like Catholic school would also be linked to my Irish roots and me being gay. So I would do, I would copy and paste them into several then. And then I would have a separate document then called my five minutes. And I start to, so the, when I, when it comes to making a five minutes or later on a 10 minutes or whatever, I would look through my documents mm-hmm. and see what I'd pull from like, like boards, you know, are they all plastered over the room? Like conspiracy no, rooms? No, they're no, all, no, computer. no, okay. still like a nice tidy room. <laughs> <laughs> I would be chaos. You might have Everyone. company. <laughs> They'd be like, what the fuck is this? That's very funny. Um, so yeah, they're just online and like, even now, like on my phone, there'll be notes, um, and when I get home, I will move those notes to the relevant file. So, yeah. And you said your friends were telling you before, like, write that down. So had you told your friends before that comedy was a goal of yours? No, but I've done I've done impressions of family members since I was... I remember being five, thinking, my nan. I'd love to do a drag act off my nan, because she's just a very dramatic old Indian lady, sassy. Um, so I've always done it. I used to do my impressions of her to her, which she loved. She used to be like, again, one more time, but not the hand. I don't do the hand like this. I used to be like, oh, hun, have you seen yourself? Um, so I also did impressions. My mum would get me to do impressions of my cousins in Ireland and stuff like all my priests. Um, and so there was always that, you know, very, I think it's quite Irish behavior, the crack, the carry on, bold. You know, we always were one for that kind of thing. How would you explain crack to people that don't understand it? I think if I have to explain it, then you don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> I would say like innate, organic DNA quality for mischief and shenanigans. That was the best description I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. You had that preloaded. I didn't actually. Up. But it's amazing. in our genes though, isn't it? Like yeah. we know what it is as Irish people to have that. I yeah. think it's 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 a it's a currency that we have. Yeah. And it's it's very I find You're it not very bringing difficult. it today, obviously. No, not at all. <laughs> Ever, really, Jen, ever. I'm just defeated at all times. Uh, well, I mean, if you're going to pull out poetry when I ask you for a definition and it's not preloaded, what do you want from me? Um, unbelievable. Roasted. Jan over there is about to cry. Um, so you went in a, into like how you developed your first five. It was notes and stuff like that. Um, but there ob- there must have been an inclination before. Yeah, I had friend that friend I met in Ireland when we had to sleep the night on the beach. I would do little shows for her and like impressions. <laughs> oh, that sounds dodgy, doesn't it? I would do little shows for her. She would pay uh, me. She, she would pay me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'd do like comedy shows and impressions of people we'd met along the way. Or she'd dare me to speak to someone <coughs> in an accent. Like we got locked out of the late early till late shop which shut at half past seven in the evening and i had beef with the manager about that and we would do dares like she was meeting her mother's old boyfriend from the 70s and i said please go up to him and say like she's american were you my mother's boyfriend 20 years ago so like implying <laughs> that you're the daughter and she did it and the man's face went white she's like dad and <laughs> He literally went, I was going to have a stroke. She went, I'm fucking with you. I'm teasing you. You're not my dad. Um, so we would do these little jokes. But I remember her saying to me, you should try stand up. And I, I kind of put it to bed. 
And I think I wanted to be a bit more serious. I was like, no, I'm going to be a writer, actually. Um, but it kept coming back to comedy. It's the thing I can do the most naturally, the most easy. Because when I, when I would do other things like write, it was work. I'd be mm. like, oh, I have to do that. That's where comedy, I would drop everything to do it. So I just come to the reasoning that this is what I really want to do and it's time. And I'm glad it's now because um, I feel like I've got all the skill set for it. I've got the stories. I've got so many stories. When people say stuff like, I wonder what I'm going to write about. I'm like, oh, <laughs> my Bye thoughts are queuing up. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've had to buy support for my thoughts. There's a support act for my thoughts. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you mentioned the London, the London Irish. That's the the centre for the pensioners. Am I correct? Yes, for all types of Irish people. I run the day centre, so 200 Irish pensioners on our books. You can imagine the carry on, and I do a lot of that on my set. And I am working on a sitcom about uh, a gay man running a day centre with his pensioners and nursing home um, that I'm currently working on now because there's just so many stories about that. So I mean, brought, brought them on holidays and day trips. You can imagine Unbelievable. the just chaos. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I so, mean, the things that they would say is, well, like, Dean, I don't care who you love, man, woman, <laughs> bi, tie. Just don't bring home a Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know I mean? They would honestly say these things to me. They, 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 and we, are you quoting them? Do you know, like, the comedy sets? I've coming? embellished them a little bit, but it's the kind of, I, I can more like go into their character and imagine what they would have said. I mean, I have a line where I say, Dean is homo sapien and proud. <laughs> now, they didn't say that, but they did say he's part of the BLT community. <laughs> So, you know, so I take that character, Mary Murphy, I always embody because the stuff that she would say. And then I, I kind of run with what that must be like. Yeah. yeah. But that, that is such an advantage to have that, that backlog of. Yeah. Sort yeah, of absolutely. Life experience. But when yeah. you said you wanted to be a writer, what was the sort of, who were you sort of envisioning Dean would be? Like academic, well, novelist? Just award winning, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I loved Tolkien books and I loved historical fiction. And um, then I got more into like kind of gay literary fiction. Um, so yeah, like, like Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides and like Small Island by Andrew Levy. Just, I found I started going towards books about children of immigration because mm. when you're, when you're from people, when you're from here, but your people are from somewhere else, you always hear about back home. We did this and back home becomes an amazing place that is fun and scary and good and bad. Apples back home are this, mm. but the regime back home was this. And it becomes on high and it really informs how you live your life. And you, you kind of a little bit lost about who you are here today then. But it really, I think having to be a, a people that have left home is sad and bitter and funny um, and connects you. So I just, there's so much in there for characters that I uh, wanted to write around like immigrant stories, like over generations in London, because that's what London is. It's a yeah, gorgeous like, melting pot. When I go to other places, I'm like, this is dry. <laughs> yeah, no diversity <laughs> yeah, whatsoever. Yeah. You've got one place that says Perry Perry Chicken, but I mean, come on. <laughs> that's cool. I can't wait for the Lord of the Rings of London to eventually come around, written by Dean. <laughs> um, so then you were doing your writing, and then we did we say lockdown kicked in when you started? Um, or for comedy writing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I just kept writing and then I'd signed up to a comedy store course and they said, look, the course will happen once we can go back. And then in September 21, October 21, the course opened again. And um, I started that course. It was a six week course, just focused on doing five minutes. But week one, you had to get up and do two minutes. And that was terrifying because I thought my stories were funny. My friends in my kitchen did under the influence of my cocktails, <laughs> but going up and doing it to other people. Mm. And when they laughed, I was like, oh my God, thank God. Holy Mary, mother of God. <laughs> thank God they've laughed, you know? And, and when like the lockdown ended, were you straight onto the course? Was it like yeah. you were- I was, yeah, yeah, I yeah. signed up straight away. <laughs> I was there an hour early. It's like, hi, like, <laughs> hi guys. Here, very much house ready. And did you have all the documents printed off from like the No, the I wasn't topics? that. I'm like, I'm just not, I'm not a complete <coughs> geek. I'm more bookish, which is like a geek with We're a We're here tan. for the nerds. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, I had some things on my phone and I, I thought about intros and opening lines. And um, uh, the thing is, there's two houses of writing, especially with fiction. One is that you build up loads and loads and loads and then you have to chip away. Um, you have to chip away that massive lump to get the goods. That is one way. The other way is that you build slowly upwards. So you add a little bit more, you add a little bit more. Mm. I'm the first one, which I much prefer because editing down is so much easier. Mm. If I have to edit five into um, two minutes, that's much easier than finding a new five. And I'll give you an example. Mike Gunn done the course, but my 
My joke now, as it stands, is I wear these bangles for my Asian heritage. The sound they make when they move always remind me of my nan. And I really wish I thought that through because that's my wanking hat, right? <laughs> that's the joke. So now, the first version of that was an essay. This talk represents my Irish heritage. These stacking bangles, which you normally represent dowry, they reminded of b -b 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 it went on for so long. And Mike was able to just be like, hi, hello. I have to retire in a couple of years. <laughs> Cut her down. And so that's easy to do, though. It's easy to yeah. cut down. Some other people in the course had the opposite issue, which is harder, because how do you run away and quickly find a minute, you know? So. Yeah, I did an English degree for one year, and the only thing I took away from the whole thing was the guy was like, please just write far too much yeah. and cut it down. So yeah. I think that's that's very helpful. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, and then from there, did you do the showcase of the show? Yeah, so it was six weeks into the showcase, but it woke something in me. I was like, I didn't realize how much I wanted it till I started to do it. Mm. And I started to be like, I said to the other people on the course, let's meet outside of this. Let's go and do like a dry run somewhere. Let's go and see live comedy. Um, and I, I was like, so excited. Loads of people dropped out because they were so nervous. It woke something in me. Honestly, I feel like I feel like the matrix, the plug was taken out, you know, and I was like, bing, I was there. Um, and so, yeah, I did the showcase and we were meant to do five minutes, but Mike let me do eight because I had a lot to say and I got a big mouth. <laughs> so um, they let me close it and I did eight minutes and I absolutely loved it. And it was at the comedy store. So you're like, this is my first gig officially. I had done another little one the day before just to practice. And you're like, all the gigs are like this, Mike? Yeah, comedy store like this. <laughs> yeah, like, what a great way to start. <laughs> little did I know the next week I'd be in a bar in Ballam with two and a half people. <laughs> <laughs> One of which I forced to bring with me. Unbelievable. Uh, so did you go from the like the showcase just to gig in straight away? I was really lucky. I went to Comedy Virgins, did a gig, and they said, can we, I won the little cup, and they said, can we hire you privately? I said, yes, you can. Oh, for comedy, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> and I did. they said to me, can you come and do uh, a gig? It'll be 300 people. It'll be in a rugby club in Surrey. Lovely little gig. Oh, really nice. Got there. Football club in Croydon. That was very different. I could smell it before I went in. <laughs> so I was, like, I was like updating my will on my phone. <laughs> I leave my Madonna CDs to my cousin. Um, but I loved it and they were lovely. Um, and funnily enough, like the people I'm more popular with are like those, those kind of lads. Um, Why do you think that is? Just, I think it's because I'm so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, just, you know, I don't. I think they love the audio, Dan. You know, it's tougher for those people. <laughs> I think they love a carry on, and that kind of lad love if you can give it back. Mm. And I, I absolutely can, and I love that. To, they love that to and from. Um, usually, like a lad and their girlfriend, they're, they're the people that will come up to me afterwards. Um, and I am from like a council state region. I do a lot about that, and I think they like that kind of. If you can hold your own, I think they respect it. And where do you I, think you've got this ability to hold your own from from the council estate? I've did, I've been dealing with hecklers since I was seven. Honestly, <laughs> I really have. Like, uh, obviously, not particularly manly on a cancel estate. Uh, wasn't Indian enough for the Indian kids. Wasn't Irish enough for the Irish kids. But wasn't white enough for everyone else. Um, wasn't manly enough for the in lads. Wasn't wasn't quiet enough for the priests or the teachers in school. I would tell them about themselves and their book. Actually, uh, <laughs> so I was taking on everyone and was dealing with hecklers. And I can't fight everyone. But what I can do is give a little piece back. So you're not going to get away with saying that. Have that. And then I might have to run. Do you know what I mean? Mm. If they'd be like, faggot. I'm like, I am because with your mum last night and she turned me. Then, <laughs> <laughs> then I had to run down the muse because 10 lads are coming for me. <laughs> Don't say that about our mum. <laughs> Crying in tears. You've awakened something. So I think, and it's quite queer energy. I think gay men in particular, gay men, because they're often with kind of straight men who get annoyed by them. Um, gay men in particular are good at this belittling back or or using intelligence or humor to to fight back because you can't fight everyone so um and gay men of my generation i think in particular good you and, keep saying everyone as if there's like you'll fight some people you know there's there's some number of people where it's like it will be physical alteration so have we got a number for that yet, or? i mean i would have been up for that if it's one-on-one -on -one, <laughs> I made the mistake of once telling my mum about these boys, forgetting she was Irish for a minute. Well, she went up the, the station with a wooden spoon in her dressing gown to take them on. Show me them. Where are they? That lanky, limey prick over there. I was like, mum, please, that is not going to help my popularity with my Irish mum fighting my battles. But yeah, that's him, mum. Get him quick. The ginger one. <laughs> so, so you went from comedy showcase success, doing eight minutes, and then you got... You did one gig and they were like, can you do a professional gig yeah, first? And is that a very common experience? No, it's not. Days? And they paid me 50 quid and I bought this with it. <laughs> I thought, I'm going to buy something special. And I loved it. And it woke something in me. And I thought, do you know what? 
I'd saved a little bit of money on the side, and in my head, unofficially, that was comedy money, because you know sometimes, so I can go to other gigs, I can uh, so far, and I won't be at a loss, and and you know I don't need to worry about making a profit right now. It's just about getting out, and um, I realised how much I loved comedy. I did I did gigs for like a month, <coughs> and then there was another lockdown that Christmas, and so I didn't gig for a month, and I couldn't believe how much. I missed it. It was like, even though I'd only been going five weeks, it was like an arm had been cut away. I was like, this, what, just life? And to go back to this now, <laughs> what's to become of me? You know, I'm single, I don't have kids, I have a couple of house plants, that's it. But I was like, I was just at home, be like, well, I'm just going to have dinner and speak to a friend. Is that? Do they not know who I am? Yeah, okay. yeah. It felt empty. And so when the doors opened again in that January, which would have been January 22, I was like a horse at the bolt. I went for it. And in my first year, I did 200 gigs. Wow. So, and and then I entered competitions. I entered gong shows. Uh, I didn't even really know what a gong can, show can you Can you describe what a gong show is? Sorry. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a battle whereby... So yeah, gong show is where you go, three people are given a card. Um, some you get a grace period of two minutes, some you don't. You go up there and you have to be funny. The minute you're not funny, they will hand up three cards and you're gonged off. But they are very brutal, and they usually come with lots of heckles, and they're um, notoriously uh, mean. Yeah, but I loved them. So I did my first one here in Vauxhall in the January, and I won it, and I was so excited. And my friend told me about one called King Gong, which I'd never heard of, and I thought, oh, that'd be a nice, cute little another one. And I went there, and it was four hundred people, and honestly, the, the, the heckles that they were—they dragged someone off stage, they heckled the MC. They did not give a shit. So if you look at my clip, I just go up there and I insult them for five minutes. I fret, I threaten to analyze every lad in there. Uh, the things I say, I just go for it. I, I, I just absolutely go for it. But I, I won it and I didn't really know till afterwards what it was, King Gong, and, and the doors it can open. And then I did the blackout one and then I did the top secret one. And they opened up a lot of doors and they raised your profile. Then I did some competitions and um, all relatively, like that was in the first six months. But was that strategic of you? Like, did you no, see these? I didn't plan to do that. I wanted to do competitions because I'd read some books by comedians and I definitely wanted to do some of the bigger national competitions. But I hadn't thought of a gong thing. I hadn't thought of that. But then I was there. And also, this sounds silly, but a little bit of this is therapeutic. This is, day now can get your asses back for school and for my, since I was seven. Day now can give it back to the man. And actually, it's quite therapeutic because it's been it's practicing kind of, all those years. Are you seeing just the bullies' faces in the audience? You're like, I'm yeah, before, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, some of them are still hot though. I've reached out <laughs> to some of my bullies, and if they want to really make it up with me, there's certain things they can do <laughs> when their wife is out of town. <laughs> but there is something in there, like the queer hurt child parenting and getting some closure. On That's that. really cool. Um, you mentioned comedians' books. What sort? Can you remember what were your sort of favorite books? Well, I swear to God, I'm not just saying it. But one of the first ones I read was Tom Allen's, and I was like, I was using it as a bible. It's like Tom Allen, he says you should drive. <laughs> I booked my driving lesson. Tom Allen applied for these competitions. Oh, wait, sorry, you didn't drive at I all. I didn't drive. No, because I'm from London. And then the, our Lord and Savior Tom Allen <laughs> spoke through the through the Bible. She and... did. She said to me, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna have to get a car then, maybe, perhaps, Lee. Um, and so I booked lessons and um, I entered the same competitions and just to navigate it, like he, he speaks beautifully about his first gig and what's that like um, and, and how you got that gig and stuff like that. And then I read Michael McIntyre's, um, I read all of Alan Carr's and I read Joe Lysett's uh, and then I tried to read uh, the books of some comedians I didn't necessarily know so much like Sarah Pascoe um, and some of the others like that and, and, and took from all of them but this certain themes started coming they all spoke about for example particular agents so when I then met those agents next to famous comedians instead of being starstruck by the comedian I was like hello lovely to meet you. oh my god it's the agent quick <laughs> and I knew their names and hugged them uh, even if they didn't want to be hugged so but I really did use them and, and and then I remember with my friend booking tickets for Tom Allen, me and her, because he was coming to play on this tour, uh, my hometown. And she said, wouldn't it be amazing if comedy takes off and you can't come to the gig because you're supporting him and we have to give your ticket to my boyfriend? And I was like, oh my God, it would be so amazing. Also, he's not getting that ticket for free. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's exactly what happened. When he comes oh. to Chatham at the end of March, I'd be supporting him. I'd give my ticket to my friend's boyfriend and I'm going to be... That's a real kind of manifestation or I don't know what it is, but serendipitous or what the God's just giving. But it really absolutely 
bows me over and moves me that that happened because I was studying that book being like, I'm going to drive. Yeah, I'm going to try my hand at this. And now I'm going to be like opening with 20, which is going to be lovely. I mean, I need to think about, I've probably slept with half the audience in that one, but I ain't going to say anything to their wives. Like, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so what other lessons can you remember from the book is that super helpful so you said the car is a big one and why is that because it opens up like gigs outside of london are so different like i did some gigs, gigs in bristol recently and it's like gosh they're not all bringers and and they're, they're hungry for comedy and like i'm not playing to a room of 12 people and their 12 best friends mm. not that i am in london there's lots of lovely options in mm. london but there are so many nights and so many of them are bringer nights and which is if people that don't know is like when a comedian has to bring a friend and essentially that's the audience and you're playing to comedians and their friends but also just the first of you for humor um and well for example like rosie jones i'll be doing tour support in march i'll be driving her so uh, mm. you had to have a car for that gig so it opens up loads of kind of options also when i, I headlined at a gig in bristol and i was able to drive home afterwards yeah. I, the trains wouldn't have run at that time so also whilst, whilst you're driving you can go over your set and stuff like that. So I'm really enjoying it now. There's no going back. <laughs> Literally, I'm going to my local Sainsbury's in the car. Fuck the planet. <laughs> um, I love the idea of you and the driving instructor being there and you're just like, what do you think of this? You're just like, what's going on? I need to drive right now. By the way, can I go? I have the gig yeah, in yeah, yeah. Here's the joke about gear sticks. What do you think, <laughs> Nigel? Um, but uh, is, is 200 gigs common in the first year? I don't think so, no. Oh. I, 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 but, you know, I didn't really worry about what other people were doing. Like, I've got really high energy levels i'm a night owl so i can i can come home from a gig and write for two hours and, and get up on four hours sleep go to work and then go to another gig so i, I don't worry about any of that and I, it's not my business what other people will do and like i set myself to do as much as i can in this year and work work you know and there was a time where i was doing a gig and they said oh the lineup's changed russell howard is going to be on just after you you're comfortable with 10, aren't you? And I'd been going two months and I had five minutes. I went, mm, gosh, so comfortable. So, so comfortable with that 10. Mm, gosh, too comfortable, some have said. Well, I put down that phone and I ran out and I did 28 gigs in 10 days. Honestly, I was I was, I, I was, was just on high. I was like doing gigs everywhere, trying out new material left, right and centre, just so that I could scrape together a bare 10 minutes that was passable. Do you know what I mean? Um, I mean, I thought it was great at the time, but I listened back now. I'm like, mm -hmm, <coughs> gosh. And um, regarding your new material, like, do you have like an approach to get a new material? Are you writing it down word for word? Are you ad libbing, or what? What's your sort of? Methodology? Have you heard about like talking head technique? No, like, so in talking heads, like um, Alan Bennett does it with monologues. It's when you write um, via speaking. So you might sit at your desk, or I, I walk around my kitchen and I say it aloud. Um, and pretending that there's an audience there, I'll try out a joke aloud. And it really influences your writing, I think, rather than kind of typing or writing. And to get even nerdier, are you recording this with like a voice app? Is there like No, I'll go over it again and again and again, and then I'll record it once it's final. So like I've got a new song I'm doing at the moment, and I literally did that in my kitchen at 2 a.m. Um, I went over it like for an hour, and then once I was happy-ish with it, I, I recorded it, and then that's ready to go out and workshop in some gigs. And when you say workshop at gigs, what does that mean, just trying it out? Do you, like, yeah, so do you that, put it in between good material, bad material? Or what, what do you do? Yeah, so basically, if if you pay in me, then I will give you I will give um, the hits. If you're not paying me, I'm going to bring in some new stuff and do some <laughs> workshop stuff. Is my rule, unless it's like a fundraiser for like Christian orphan trees or something. But but as a rule, I'm going to like bring in new bits to try. Like you got to make it work for you. Um, but if if Sometimes I sandwich it in between bits that generally work. Mm. So that's a good way to do it. But yeah, then you workshop it. Like I tried that song on Friday at Backyard, realized it, it went down well, realized it was far too long. This isn't my MTV Unplugged. I can lose one of the choruses. <laughs> then tried it again on Sunday, lost the first verse. And then I tried it again last night and now it's too short. So um, tonight I'll be doing the most up-to-date version in time for... A big gig on Friday. I mean, like, Voxel, Backyard, Top Secret, Comedy Store, Tour Support, where they're paying money. Like, if they're big gigs, you got to bring you got to bring the um, the goods, obviously. Yeah. But like I said, and I have done loads of these when you're doing two and a half people in a pub in Borstal, one of which walks out halfway through, the other which the other person says, "What is that on stage?" <laughs> Do you know what I mean, when you're doing those, fuck it. You know? Just all day. Yeah. yeah. Just spoken word. I've yeah, yeah, yeah. just spoken word. Speak at some poetry. Point. <laughs> Um, yeah, so is that the worst? Because all we've heard so far is success, and obviously you've had a lot, but is is there like a horror story? With my accent, horror, horror story. Yes, yes, there are. It happened in Strood. And I said from the minute I arrived at the, the gig, I said, these people are drinking far too much. Like, 
I remember a girl going, oh my God, I got two, two just for me. And she had two bottles of Prosecco. And I was like, it's seven o'clock. Like I'm on at nine. What's this going to be like? By the time it got to me, the front row were gagging. They were like, Bleh. and I was like, oh. I was doing joke. Oh, Stacey, get the bin. I was like, this was all played out. And I kept stopping be like, can you help your friend? I think, I think you need to help your friend. And I was trying to make it funny. I was like, and she's famous for swallowing, but I don't think she's going to do that today. I think today she needs your help. And the friends were like, no, leave her alone. She's fine. Are you fine? And they were really loud. And in the end, she, I mean, she got sick and they were just we're like, we're embarrassed. I was like, and yet you're screaming at the top of your voice. I had to definitely help them out. And it just it just completely, if you set something up, you just completely can't. Because I'd be like, and then my nan said to me, I was like, oh, God, I've that whole joke now. That's not it. I mean, I'm quick on my feet, but, but um, I mean, I had to listen to her for an hour after the show. I'm so sorry, Dean. <laughs> Dean, I'm so sorry. I love I loved your set about being Jamaican and Welsh. It's like, oh my god. <laughs> Goddess is testing me today. Do not take my earrings off and strike her. I was gonna ask, is there any moment where you've like questioned like comedy is what you want to do, or has it just been no, even with those nights you're like, No, 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 because that was on her. Like yeah. of course some jokes don't always land or you don't deliver it the right way. I don't like when audi when comedians blame the audience, because like it's it's going to be a bit on you as well, like your delivery. And some things you just don't do the right way or you might need to tweak. Um, um, but you can always salvage it. It's between other stuff that works well. Or I've seen some great comedians make fun of the fact, well, well that was the new bit anyway. And I, that's a great technique to do. Yeah. Um, so, and as you do longer sets as well, there's a natural lull. Mm. And I didn't realize that, but like from 20s on, there's a... There should be a lull because they can't be that attentive the whole time and, and, and heckling and, and laughing. Stomachs, like, yeah, so yeah exactly. Yeah, physically, over. just for their own good, I incorporate a lull just for their safety. Really, Reese. <laughs> <Just> finally, <laughs> finally, we get a break. But yeah, there have been. There've definitely been. I did like a private gig at a, a golf club. Very posh. Um, uh, paid really well, but very posh. Stern Saxon faces <coughs> just staring at me, and then afterwards, a woman come up to me and said partly asian you're partly indian <laughs> who knew i didn't <laughs> and then she said you were you were funny in parts and then walked away and i was like, I was like part of me was like absolute icon <laughs> the other part thought maybe i could tackle the bitch um but i, I was like oh my god imagine coming up to someone and saying asian who knew <laughs> i didn't <laughs> like i hadn't updated the newsletter and told miriam from richmond but um i kind of I giggle when I get nervous and I quite like those awkward situations because I'm a confident person. It will shock you mm -hmm. to say, but like job interviews, they're lucky if I turn up, you know, so I, <laughs> I don't get nervous. I usually change the time to make them suit my needs. I have some questions for you. That's <laughs> yeah, from yeah I'm that bitch. <laughs> Thank you. I think um, <laughs> if John has an apple, um, singing a song in a pub, you name it like that, I'm not really nervous. However, the thought of doing comedy made me nervous and that I really liked that. I was like, gosh, that, May, that means it's dangerous. That means there's something at stake. It's important. I wanna, I wanna get onto that. Mm -hmm. So I think if things should be dangerous. Like when you have a relationship, you should feel scared and anxious sometimes. Mm -hmm. If you're just like, yeah, then that's a sign, isn't it? And you know? what's making you scared and anxious at the moment? Um, well, not just scared and anxious, but you just get a little stump, uh, feeling in your stomach where you think, I want it to go well. I want this to land. <laughs> You know, that's the kind of thing. The scale you went at is like from even from literally the the comedy store is already a massive gig yeah. for people who don't know it's huge. And then you're doing comedy versions, which straight to pro gig is like that's you're just right. Yeah, up the, you know, I've been really ramp. really lucky. No, 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 not lucky at all. You worked really hard, but I mean, did did the scale affect? No, you I want to say lucky, so I seem grounded. <laughs> <laughs> no, you Usually this very is hard. the pose for grounded. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have uh, no. I mean, okay, I do think I've been lucky. Just people took to me, and also what I've been dealt with is lucky. Like I am, I'm Irish, I am Indian, and I am gay. Um, and also, I'm light, so even racists in Essex like me. You know I mean? <laughs> I'm winning all the demographics. Um, and I've worked in the fields that I've worked for so long. I have so many stories and things I can tap into. I've literally had other comedians be like, I wish I could do those things and those accents, but I'm not allowed. I'm like, well, <laughs> raise it with God, darling. Like, <laughs> that's not on me. So I think some is some is luck. Some is the luck I've been drawn, like the, the who I am. But I have also worked hard. I definitely have worked hard, like... Like for a year, my friends, I was like, I had my friends, I haven't dated. And to my friends, I was like, hon, you have to, 
I'm sorry, I'm going to be shit this year because I've got three and a half gigs tonight. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm. After work, you know. Um, so is, I, it, is it tough to book those gigs? Like, what's the sort of admin you're doing for this now? Like, where are you at with that? I think a lot of people watch King Kong online. I didn't mm. realize that. So the, the one I did, the like two and a half thousand watched it. I, I'm still getting gigs off the back of that, which mm. is lovely. Mm. Um, I think if people see you do well at certain things or you're in a competition, mm. you get things. And there's not always logic. Like I was in the final for LGBT comedian of the year in June. I didn't win it. Um, I didn't even come top three. So obviously <laughs> there was something in the water. Rigged. I heard it was rigged. <laughs> I heard it was. Too beautiful to win, some said. Um, I, I didn't come top three. But I tell you, on the back of, off the back of that and the video clips of that, the gigs I got, that June, I did corporate gigs. I did 10 corporate gigs, and they were £300 a time for doing 15 minutes. And I don't know why I don't know why they didn't ask the winners. I don't know mm. why. And I know sometimes they didn't because I asked mm. them. Um, I don't know why they saw that and be like, this lad that didn't win, let's book him. I, I, that's not my business. I don't know why. Maybe maybe it's criteria. Well, he's the part, he's the part ethnic. You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, maybe because of my personality, I'm, I'm, I know I'm, I would bring loudness to any space no, i go for everyone well Up obviously you're not doing stand up <laughs> here but you are yeah it was amazing i seen you at the irish event and oh, um myself and another man behind me were like this is what is going on what is <laughs> happening we were everyone was just bitter confused we're like is this an option i didn't know people could laugh like this i think someone <laughs> fell over i think you got a standard ovation um, i've had people wet themselves yeah I, I was really close i don't want to admit it but i was close uh yeah my girlfriend was there with me and she was like oh wow is that comedy i was like yeah okay <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. But yes. Although I should say, for the flip side of that, the first gig of that I did was four and a half people in a pub where I was competing against the football that they were showing live. So I feel like you're still going to win. Do you know what? I can sing higher and louder than that television. <laughs> so I made sure that by the end, eyes were on me. Has there ever been a gig where there's been silence, like to your performance, like people are just not on board? I really can't imagine. That's no, not me being insincere. I feel no. like you're going to get someone so on board regardless. Of... No, there hasn't been. I've been at gigs where that's happened and it's god awful. <laughs> what I did have once, though, which was crippling because it's hard to come back from, is someone who went, oh. I was like, oh my God, what do you do for that? I was making a fat joke. I said, I'm so fat that from the other side of the street, people have confused me for a happy lesbian couple. And and usually that gets a love. And she went, oh, don't. I get the, these all in my day-to-day -day life. Oh, do so, you? Yeah, just constant, just try and stuff. You're like, fine. Can I have a latte? Oh, no, and I literally God. had to be like, I did that with Susan, I know I'm fine. I'm up here. This is a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a little bit like in the moment. Ah. You can never read the room, but I kind of like that thrill. Mm. And it keeps you on your toes. Like... It really does. Like, I think it's really important not to have, I mean, I'm teasing when I'm saying this, this, some of this stuff, but it's important not to have an ego because I've definitely known comedians that come off stage and like, I smashed that. I was fucking amazing. And I'm always like, well, oh, gosh, that's <laughs> it's the Catholic guilt in me. I just no way could come off stage and say that. I come off stage, I'm like, okay, I'm happy with that. That's a seven. I could do this and I could do that, but it's enough to be nice to myself. I'm like, it's enough. You did, you did well. Here's two areas because you always got to look to do, to be better, mm. and I think that's the healthier approach. And also, you seem less like a leviathan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I never really linked the Catholic guilt to the ego thing. That's really cool. Actually. Yeah, yeah. I think. Do you not? No, no. Well, I, I'm probably just a massive ego. Well, as we found out earlier, you're only half Catholic. That's what it is. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> full disclosure. Um, they just outed me to the. I can tell that by the devil's I, tail. I have, I have <laughs> hidden my my Protestant father for all of these years, but no, I thank you, Dean. Yeah, it was there in your dance moves. It was there in my high speak. I don't know if it's speak Gaelic. Uh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but with all of these gigs, how do you, how do you prevent? Have you burnt out, or how do you prevent burnout? No, I don't really recognise that as a phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. I've got really high energy levels. I'm fine on six hours sleep. I've had six hours of sleep now. I've always been like that. Um, and also, when I come home, I turn on at night like my head is busy. When I get home from a gig, say it might be one a.m., I often write then, or I call a, like my parents live in Thailand, my sister lives in Australia, my bestie lives in America. So there's always someone awake somewhere, and we chat. Um, yeah, and I just I don't really get burnt out. I think because I'm really really ready. Mm. I feel like everything up until my first gig was prep. Mm. And my friends say that, be like the songs you used to write for fun, the the impressions you would do, the impressions of your nan. They're literally in my sets now. And I feel like the different accents I've always done. And and then people would commission things. They'd be like, can you do this at my birthday party? That's funny. Mm. I feel like I've been prepping, so I'm really, really ready. So you have this, this like, the iceberg thing just where it's, there's so much. Yeah. And also I will say like, I was, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but I was so shocked to meet comedians who aren't funny offstage. Yeah. And I, I meet so many 
I, I relate more to the ones who I think are more like me, which they love humor in their everyday life. Like I've been out with mates and they're like, mate, you can turn off now. I'm like, hun, I am performing. This is part of me. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, I love humor. I love watching humor. I mean, I think I have such a good time on stage. Like if I laugh at my jokes, then I'm happy. Yeah. You know? And did you have to cultivate having a good time or are you just genuinely have? No, I'm having so much fun. Yeah. So much carry on. I don't know what someone's going to say and I get excited. Like when I did Top Secret Gong, I walked out and I went, hi, so I'm a gay. And the lad put his card up straight away. And I said, darling, don't be homophobic. Your dad wasn't last night. And he absolutely, the crowd went absolutely wild. And we had a to and from, do you know what I mean? Mm. There's been loads of good, I love that challenge. I, I, I had another thing with a dad uh, uh, and a lad and he went, my dad's dead. I said, I oh, know, we were on the Ouija board all night. And he, he was giving it back. And afterwards he ran up to me and gave me a hug and he loved that kind of carry on. So I love that excitement because you never know what it's going to be. Yeah, I've heard you've actually got like specific rules for dealing with hecklers because I, I think a lot of people's fear in life, regardless of they do the comedy or not, is someone shouting at them in a room of yeah. people and they have to come up with something yeah, on the spot. Yeah, so yeah. like, what are you thinking when someone heckles? Well, I love a heckle. And I, I'm always like, oh, challenge accepted. <laughs> You know, I hear the Kill Bill music in my head. I'm like, darling, you're dancing with a gay now. <laughs> and sometimes I can see people that they don't know not to dance with a gay. They're going to get it. Um, uh, yeah, most often or not, I, I think uh, I've not been flummoxed yet. It could happen. And I would never start with a, with a fellow gay because that's the ultimate battle and we haven't got the time. <laughs> So you have to just try and shut them down. I'm like, mm -mm, this could get this could get ugly. I don't want no rainbow warfare here. But if it's a generic lad yeah. just saying something like, "Oh, show me your tits," do you know what I mean? Then I then I'm like, well, excuse me, excuse me for a minute. And I'll be like, darling, if you want to see my tits, they're, they're really low at the moment. They're currently my socks. But if you want to see them at their best, ask your wife to show you the pictures she bought me online. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but you must get excited at like a competition when you know, like, because that's such a superpower, I guess, yeah. for anyone to be able to respond to be so comfortable on stage that you must be so excited then when someone heckles you. Yeah. Like, Thank you. Okay. I'd no. much prefer a heckle than a really polite audience that are, do we laugh at the semi ethnic? I don't know, do we? <laughs> do you know, that I hate. If you're heckling, they're up for it and they're, less, and they're not really trying to bring you down. They're seeing if you can meet the challenge. Mm. And everything about me hints that. I can, you know, a sassy gay man, they, they, they're they going to be like, oh, he, he wants to play, let's mm. play. And I love that. And those lads always come up to me afterwards, want to buy a drink, want to want to hug me, and I hold them for far too long. <laughs> but they do, we have that <laughs> They hold of, you back. <laughs> yeah. It's just their wife saying, can we go, Gary? <laughs> Not yet, Susan. I feel safe. One more minute. I've nearly <laughs> absorbed all his powers. <laughs> so, uh, have so, have yeah. you ever crossed the line, do you think, with a heckler, or are you very conscious of what you're doing? No, I haven't. I mean... No, I haven't, because it's always it's always about someone that speaks out, um, or I might just if someone's chatting in the distance, I just might be like I did this at Frog in the Bucket. I was like, shh, 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 shh. there's a gay on stage now. Come on, <laughs> that's okay. <so> <laughs> you know that kind of thing. I did see a clip though, and I was speaking to him about him when I met him at Comedy Store. Name drop, Larry Dean. Have you seen the heckler he got? And he dealt with it amazingly. And even I would struggle. The heckler kicks off saying it's she's not enjoying her time. I've seen this yet. But her dad's dying and she came out for a good night. And the, the issue there is the sympathy is on the heckler because it's such a tragic situation. It's not a man trying to be a dick to belittle someone because that empowers me already. But that situation, I watched that and I said to him when I met him, like, oh, my God, I, you dealt with it like a gentleman. I just think I would have my bow would have fallen out and I would have cried. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, he, he did amazingly. But he, what, what do you think? Why do you think he did so well in that situation? I think he thought of the bigger thing. Like it's a human here. Let's not think about entertainment or how I look on stage. Let's just, he was really polite, said, I'm sorry that's happening to you. I'm sorry, mate. And she, she said, oh, I'm going to go. And he went, maybe you should. He was a gentleman about it. And I think that was really good. I think I'm far too damaged to have been that much of a gentleman about it. I'd want, <laughs> I'd want a little bit of sass. You know I mean, even to confront her in the women's toilets afterwards. Do you know what I mean? But, but I watched that and thought, oh, God, it's petrifying. But you can also ignore something because when you're going up you think everyone sees it mm. but or hears it they don't i did this thing at um 21 soho loads of agents were there loads of acts that i really really look up to and respect uh it was it was uh dan fox and friends it was his night on my way to the stage i fell and, <laughs> and complete <laughs> oh complete sack of spuds <laughs> face down in the video i just disappear and then i pop up again suddenly smiling overly smiling i went up on stage 
And Dan smiles, said, you know, he was smiling. He was said to me like, it's fine, it's fine. I went up on stage. I could feel the blood trickling down my leg. And when I looked down, I could see that my jeans had turned purple. And all I thought was, I've got to do a high kick in these jeans in a minute. <laughs> it may be my last. But when I got on stage, I went typical Catholic on her knees. And half of the room laughed. And I realized this half of the room didn't even know I'd fallen over. Uh -huh. Do you know what I mean? So you, you expect the worst, but it's not always the case. Well, very, very well handled. Unbelievable line. Thank you. Seven ninety nine. It cost to get me jeans. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I think it's fair to say for the the standard stereotype of comedians is like they're not the healthiest people. So, what is mm. your sort of what is your daily routine? Yes, very much. <laughs> yes, I cannot believe the men. I work in wellbeing. I cannot believe the mental health state of comedians of the children. Mother saying honestly, I cannot like. <laughs> What, what do you see that they're doing, bro? Some of the stories bro. for Edinburgh last year as well. I was like, guys, this is not Ian Napa. You're out clubbing to 4 a.m. and then having a breakdown on stage the next day. Like, this is not Love Island, <laughs> like like the detox years. Like, I, I cannot believe it. And I've had really strict ground rules. Like, I went to therapy when I was young for four years, and I, it means so much to me, and I feel like it's equipped me with loads of stuff. Um, but also just like common sense, like I'm not here to make friends. If I make a friend, and I have made great friends, it's lovely. But I'm not here. I'm not coming to Shoreditch to club to 4 a.m. Because I did 28 gigs in 10 days, guys. I can't do that on top of my full-time job and survive and live. Like, it's lovely if I can go to some things and throw the hair back and gossip mm. and chat. But that's not why I'm here. Um, I'm here for comedy. And that's always been the, um, the focus. And with that, you know, I don't really drink at gigs. I don't need to drink to be to be fun, but I don't really drink. Um, I make sure kind of I have some time away from gigs. I'm really good at old fashioned doing nothing. I am talking, mouth breathing, staring at a space, scratching myself, and then losing an hour. You know, <laughs> like huh? You got to remember to even swallow. Like I'm, <coughs> what's going on? You know, and then switching off for hours, watching telly, um, but also being kind to yourself. Like this is a hard thing. Mm. I've got a friend who's a Broadway actress, and she's like, oh, "Gosh, I couldn't do stand up." It's a really hard thing. It's you are your writer, you are your director, you are your producer, you are the performer, and you're putting your heart on the line every night. And so now I always say to myself, "Did I do well enough? Enough is the word. I use. Did I do good enough? Um, because you don't want to get into I wasn't amazing every time because you can't be, and neither should you be, you know. So I really try and look after my my health and be nice and be fair. Maybe in the beginning I was a bit too like, oh, I only came second out of two hundred people this competition. Damn. And I was like, girl, calm yourself, lower your dosage, mm -hmm. get a decaf. Like, that's not fair. You're doing really, <coughs> really well to look back on it. And I think I'm so worried of coming across ego, like an ego or arrogant, just because I don't like that in people. I find it really an ugly quality. I'm so worried that I wasn't able, I wasn't always able to celebrate things and be like, hold on a minute, you have done really, really well. I can look back now and do that. Um, it's, you know, it's 15 months later and be like, oh God, you did okay. You did good, you know? Um, but I probably worried a little bit too much in the beginning. So if I could do it again, I'd say be a bit nicer to yourself. And to the comedians out there, I'd say like, yeah, it's 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 work. It is um, you're not here to make friends. It's comedy. Treat it like like a profession. And also, um, Sakisa said it to me early on. It's a it's a marathon, not a race. And that was it's a simple saying, but it unlocked something. Me, I was like, oh my god, absolutely. I am not dying. The sky is not falling. It's <laughs> calm. The fuck down because like, I didn't enter competition. Blah, 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 do you know what I mean? Um, and also, you don't have to win everything. Some of us have, <laughs> but you don't like. I think just getting to a final, just getting to a semi final, you get seen. Mm. I've been in, I've been in a final, and um, an agent approached me, like an, uh, a big agent approached me, um, and I didn't come top three. It wasn't the LGBT one; it was another one. And so, it really, it really. Um, and, and and got gigs and stuff like that. It really brings it home. It's not, you can get so focused on winning for this. And really when you break it down, like what the best new left-handed comedian of Coventry, like 50 pound award on a plastic tray, really in the scheme of things. <laughs> do you know what I mean? What does it's that mean? It's amazing. Don't, it's amazing. <laughs> oh, don't get me wrong. If I had that, it'd be, it'd be with me today. <laughs> but I just think, yeah, I will maybe write a, I was going to write like a blog about this for, um, for a website for comedians but then that, that particular reviewer decided he didn't like me so now he's not going to get my words for his <laughs> website mention no names <laughs> um so that's that's really so basically be be healthy have a healthier approach to yourself 
be nicer that sort of thing i think i said it much better you did i don't know that was a complete mumble we're gonna that, that, that will remain but i did have a stroke there but that's fine the accent will stay but if you had a basically of, doing like be healthy and that shit <laughs> no alcohol that's the big revelation that's all i took away i was like jesus i don't drink and i was like oh, i can't drink alcohol would help um but do you do you structure them as like actual rules for yourself? Or are you much healthier than that? Like, are you, or do you have them like, I will not drink? Is that something you've said to yourself? Oh, I see. I mean, I love a drink. I love a gin. Um, but I don't need, I never need a mm. drink to be fun. Mm. I remember before, to be fair, me and the, the uh, receptionist were dancing on the table during work. We had a little dance off. And my manager asked me if I was drinking. And I was like, no, I'm just an extra third time. <laughs> like, I'm not drinking. She's like, did you go to drama school? No, I didn't. But my point is, I've never needed a drink to be yeah. what people would call fun and stuff like that. So you've just had this sort of professional mindset from the get-go, but you didn't need to define like, okay. Oh, for comedy specifically? Yeah, for comedy specifically. No, I think it was more financial. Like, <laughs> That's a good reason as well. <laughs> seven pound a pint. <laughs> And you're like, gosh, I, if I'm doing if I'm doing 28 gigs in 10 days and they're seven pound a pint, yeah. then had I had people saying, I'll buy your drink, it would be a different story. <laughs> I would have been like, yeah. yeah. And there is a lot of that cheekiness, like when you're up and coming on the circuit as well. Like, we invite you to come to our gig on Friday where you give 15 minutes and you'll get nothing and also we'll charge you for a drink and you'll be thankful for this. Bye. There's a lot of that. I mean, don't get me wrong. My first few months, I was like, please, can I? Everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it is cheeky, isn't mm. it? Um, so, no, if, I mean, if, I mean, the gig I did yesterday, I squeezed on it because I wasn't meant to do it, but I needed to try something new in prep for tour support. Um, and you got one drink. Well, I made sure <laughs> man was a 14 pound cocktail. <laughs> And I, I demanded an umbrella. <laughs> what my money's worth? I got a train to come here. So, but yeah, I don't. I don't. That, so that's, we've reached diva status already. Then did yeah. it said immediately. She was in the building before <laughs> I did comedy. I remember. I remember being about. I was with like a family member. I remember in the supermarket, and I saw star fruit. And I thought, oh, I don't know about this. Wasn't on the official list. I want to buy some star fruit. And I asked my uncle. And he said, Dean, it's fucking far from Starford. You were born, bae. You want Starford? Your mommy's struggling to make ends meet. And you want Starford. I remember like, Uncle, it's 64 pence. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I bought the Starford. I got it. Tried it. Disgusting. It was like lemon. But I sat there and was like, mm, delicious. I don't need it again because why, why add to perfection? But <laughs> it's absolutely disgusting. I don't think you see it in the supermarkets now. But I always had, yeah, I always had that, that That's very quality. That's very cool. Um, so do you have a typical sort of daily routine at the moment? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a night owl. So I I get up at 9.57 because I start work at my desk at 10 o'clock. I just do like that to the hair and then and just <laughs> I shut the mouth and wipe the spittle. Um, yeah, I get up about 10. I work from home. I'm still working. And um, yeah, I'll cook in the day. I'll, I'll also have something marinating. I'm big into cooking. And yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll finish work and then, uh, yeah, we'll go to gigs in the evening or, or do something social. And then usually like in the evening late after a gig is when I'll do some writing, mm. things start flowing. Do you think helping the job removes a lot of stress and you're getting a lot of stories? Like what's the sort of benefit of having the, the job? Oh, that, no, my, the Irish Centre job is my previous role. Oh, okay. It's not where I'm at now. Now okay. I run a support service for LGBT refugees and there is nothing funny in the asylum system. I have looked, but it's no, it's pretty dark. So there's nothing really for comedy. But my, all my training and stuff, I'd be in the wrong job if dark things got to me. Mm. I'd be in the wrong life. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean, though? Yeah. So um, I, I very, I'm very, very boundary. And that probably comes to comedy. Like I am. I remember saying to my service users in my current job, I remember them saying, you know, like, I'm here for you. Anything you need in any which way, I am here. We can talk it through. Monday to Friday, nine to five. You message me at one past five and I'll be like, who is this? Because you're dead to me <laughs> until Monday again at nine o'clock. Mm. You know what I mean? And I think you have to be like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, all these like boundaries you say are very, very helpful. I think. For, yeah. Like Excel. And you have to be strict with people because they'll challenge them. You know. Yeah, I'm trying to get Like even down. to the extent of I say to some people, "Hi, I don't talk about this subject on WhatsApp because WhatsApp is like my social life." Um, message me on a, on the other thing to talk about that because then I can control when I look at it. You mm. know, email me about that because that I'll have more control. So I'm really strict. You have to protect yourself, especially mm. uh, in the world we're in now when there's riots, fire, war, zombie, apocalyptic. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And people are addicted to that. You yeah. Know? 
They like, the be like, did you know aliens are taking over? No. <laughs> My question was, is, do you have milk? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm concerned about the aliens. That's all I've picked up. Um, so do you have any sort of daily habits that you practice at the moment? Uh, I cook every day. Oh, and then taught cooking. me to cook. Do you go Irish or? I do cook some Irish stuff. I love, because the Irish scent I work for so long, I love a bar and brack. I love a soda. Cavan, where my mum is from, is home of Boxty. Have you had Boxty? No. No. <laughs> Again, the shame. I know. The shame that comes. I actually, I know what it is, but I haven't had it. Yeah, potato pancake, yeah, yeah uh, or potato bread, so, and stews and, and stuff like that. But also, um, my nan, who's Indian, taught me how to cook. To quote her words, as a gay, you won't have Indian wife, so I'll teach you all the recipes. <laughs> Okay. Um, and I used to go for like little cooking class together and stuff like that. So uh, I cook, but I'm from Northwest London. So I love all of my cultures, but none of them are as tasty as Caribbean food to my soul. Yeah. That's I love, fair. I love Caribbean food, but spe specifically Trinidadian food. So uh, I cook kind of that. I do cooking courses when I go away. So when I went to New Orleans, I did a cooking course. I think that is the best thing to do when you go. Oh, it's so, uh, so underrated. Yeah. Cooking isn't it? courses on holiday. And you meet people and it's, and, they're always and, so much cooler than me and I'm like are you going like, to cook this Thai food when you come home like oh, absolutely oh, no, I don't have that I'm usually the cool one but <laughs> 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 no but it's just a nice way to see stuff and, and it's New Orleans so everything started with a pint mm. of butter I was like we won't be here for 60 but <laughs> well, we are going to die smiling <laughs> So I cook every day. I definitely watch some kind of comedy every day. I, I really love comedy, obviously. Um, what sort of comedy are you watch on YouTube clips or full specials? No, like like special. I just watched Camping by Julia Davis. Do you know Julia no, Davis? She did a really good sitcom called Nighty Night. Do you watch Gavin Stacey? I have seen Gavin Stacey. Right, do you know the couple that are always fighting? They always yeah. yeah, it's that lady there. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's so British and it's so funny and just so passive aggressive and her writing is so good. Uh, I was recommended it. But... Um, yeah, so I usually watch. And then WhatsApp has been like in lockdown because I live on my own just with my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> lockdown is uh, WhatsApp has been a savior, like the different WhatsApp groups I'm I'm in and like a voice note to a mate. Mm. And I love a voice note. Mm. Um, so I think that I do a lot of those with friends. And then um, I'm really friends with the, my neighbor downstairs and my best my best mate bought the flat above me. So we check in a lot and we have dinners and stuff like that. And really good to have them that close, no yeah, organization. Yeah, dude. I also love dark stuff. I love something about a serial killer, end of the world, dragons, demons, Satan. I, I really do. I don't know why. I'm really at home with that. I mean, the I most went, positive person I've ever met. You're like, I, I, the darkness is what keeps me going. On, on, <laughs> no, honestly, there's something in that. Uh, I think so, yeah. Well, we'll lead straight into therapy then. Um, <laughs> so what practical tools have you sort of taken from therapy? Um, I think, I think a, um, being nicer to yourself is one of them. Challenging yourself, your own critical thoughts. Uh, and that looks like... Um, not always assuming the script you've written in your head is true. He thinks that because of this, this, this. He didn't message me back because of this, this, this. I don't know that. Mm. But it's really hard to challenge the super ego in your voice that will tell you that. You know, you weren't funny. They don't want you back. You're too fat. He doesn't want a second date. You know, uh, you shouldn't be with him. He's married. He's got seven kids and he doesn't love you anymore. But he's... <laughs> 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 but all those voices you know what I mean it's good to challenge and assume the opposite I remember I was dating someone at the time and I was like yeah but he doesn't like me and the therapist was like but what if he does what if he's nervous and needs you to take the lead and I thought oh god I didn't think of that as an option and that's not doesn't feel comfortable to think like that mm. it's much more comfortable to think I'm the issue you know Yeah. so I think thinking about things from the other perspective and seeing it looking at things in aerial view as well so my therapist used to get me to look at a situation here's Dane here's that person I'm looking at aerial point of view to see where each individual is coming together where they're going wrong what's being miscommunicated um, having empathy for my for myself not fooling myself a lot of it for me came back to my own stuff challenging myself more than other mm. people because you can only work on yourself you can only work on what you've mm. got to work with i can't change how the artist formerly known as my father <laughs> <laughs> may have been growing up i can't really change that you know yeah. what i mean i mean luckily the gods have made sure he's lost his hair so the sun justice revenge but he revenge <laughs> yeah yeah but um you can only kind of change yourself so um i think you may have persuaded me to finally take up therapy after the many 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 people on that, that i did me. bring that <laughs> I don't know. You seem really well adjusted. Well, you're a terrible judge of character, but I very <laughs> much appreciate that. No, um, it's just something that keeps coming up in London specifically. It wasn't really, obviously, I went to an all boys school. In, right. So, if it wasn't clear enough, but uh, <laughs> it wasn't very much discussed. But I come here and everyone, everyone's pro therapy. Not that I'm net, not that I'm like, yeah. oh, I don't believe in it, but yeah. uh, you've very much persuaded me. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I think it's really, I think it's, I think it should be like available. You know, the way in America, one of your subjects you can take is driving. Mm. I think, I think here we should have an option for like therapy at school. That's not to say we should all just embellish our issues, but I just think for me, the best therapy is about ownership. Like when you take on board and be like, it's me doing this. It's me doing that. I, I need to take ownership for this or it's me creating that pattern. Or if it's not me, I can do something that changes that pattern. You know, mm. it does. Because we have to look at the work that we can do. Because I'm not really in the purpose of getting into the blame game of things. Like, I was just raised by my mum, who is, I would say, like, I mean, everyone with an Irish mother thinks they've got the best mother in the world. Yeah. But I'm lucky in that I have. <laughs> it's so strange because my mum oh, isn't my better. <laughs> but my the artist formerly known as my father would not, <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> would not be from that background. <laughs> um, but my mother literally fought out on the streets for me and um, was a lioness. So that... That is like, do you know about resilience? Yeah. Like, and like in terms of social work, resilience is if you take two kids and say both were abused and one had no one and the other one has like an auntie they love or a puppy or a skill or like can play the fiddle really well. For some reason, those because it has some meaning and because it has some meaning because the child has some meaning in its life, um, it's able to have a bit of a shield against things that happened to it so so i was a confident <coughs> child i had a parent who loved me at least one and who would um help me with my hobbies and i i was popular to some extent in my mind because i worked in modeling and stuff like that so i would, would i would have been a nightmare for anyone trying i remember like old men trying to hit on me and i'd tell them about themselves because i had that resilience i knew i had a parent i could go back to i knew i had a dog that i absolutely loved i knew people like my personality wanted me to do stories mm. as we have a child had none of those things they are prime for being groomed and being abused if someone comes up to them it may not look like that it may just be they may they're bullied in some form but um i think resilience is really important and it can take the form of a hobby or a good relationship or or, or one good parent or one good auntie or just a feeling that you have about yourself like you're definitely passionate about things in your life mm. i can see that already so i think that's really important um my take home from that is about resilience like to because resilience is not something you're born with you can equip it you i was going to ask so how, how does how would oh it's very gen it's very general no, no, question but, but how does someone like cultivate re resilience yeah. in their life welcome caller line four um, <laughs> thank you for calling. me this is this guy's book. <laughs> i did used to work on switchboards <laughs> uh, i just want to start the conversation by saying thank you for sharing today reese it's not always difficult it's a difficult first step but it's a valuable one um i think well you'd need to look at i mean you have a relationship because mm. you have a girlfriend mm. and your face lights up when you speak about her Dude, uh, oh, you've just thrown me under the bus there but yes that is true okay. it did though that come on yeah. that's not throwing it's not throwing you under the bus in terms of her no not at all maybe with the lads yeah but um the boys the boys <laughs> um the bochley um uh so yeah like you could see what what activities you have in your life that bring something to you what hobbies you might go into something new so one of mine was was comedy so i was like i want to try comedy and now i do it's such a resilience for me mm. like it i measure it against everything you know mm. people say oh do you want to date someone at the moment I was like, i'm too busy i've got i've got I'm, I'm dating a lady at the moment called comedy <laughs> she is my all but that also makes you more attractive so they're like what you don't want is that is that me being toxic you am i being toxic <laughs> <laughs> no, of course you're not. When I'm here, like someone's after their dreams, like, oh, that's cool. I'd like to get on board. I don't know. Maybe that's. Well, I think. This is why I need therapy. It's going to come quickly clear. Women know? find men, funny men, attractive. I've seen that a lot. Generally, I'm generalizing. Please, general, please don't come for me. <laughs> and if you do, come come equipped. <laughs> I think it's almost a factual statement <laughs> yeah, at this point. But yeah. yeah. Women find uh, funny men attractive. I don't think it works so much the other way around. I don't think generally. Um, um, straight men find a funny woman as attractive. I think sometimes a bit threatened. If I'm looking at a room with comedians, oh, I'm so intimidated by it. I'm like, right, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Please. And gay men <laughs> do not find a funny gay man attractive. <laughs> you know, I bring like fun social worker gay uncle energy. They want distant daddy energy. You know, <laughs> that's what they want on stage, and that's not what I bring. So, so, um, so yeah. But that's fine. That so you're just doing this for love of the game, then that's, that's what it is. <laughs> just. <laughs> on the court every well day. questioning men is different i have had some fan interaction <laughs> my limited edition meet and greet <laughs> me so spelled so m-e-a-t <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so I, I i think uh yeah comedy is one of my resilience and before i go on stage like i i i do a little stretch out and because i sometimes sing i do a quick warm-up by singing irish rebel songs oh, of course <laughs> uh, i do yeah yeah and um I do on the train sometimes. I look around. I'll be like, no, don't look around. Freedom for Ireland. Uh, um, 
I, and I also do... Sorry, for everyone listening, if they wanted to just like YouTube an Irish rebel song, what would you recommend? Well, the classic for London is Fields of Athenry. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, isn't it? Did you uh, know, I thought you were going to ask me, do you know that one, Reese? Yeah. <laughs> I, I nearly did. Like, do you know what I read? Do you know what freedom looks like, Reese? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm checkmated um, here to be fair I don't know what to do but I do do this thing before I go on the stage where talking about resilience where I do a shielding exercise so I close my eyes and I must look absolutely batshit mental if I'm just I did it once at a gig and opened my eyes and three lads were just staring at me being like what's her deal you know what I mean but I close my eyes and um, I send some light up my body like a, like a, a bright light um, and I present it up my body and it showers down on me, over me, protecting me in layer. But all the time when I'm doing that, I think of happy moments of my life. And I think of me and my aunties laughing in the kitchen in Cavan, my mum and me having giggles with my sisters. I think of my pensioners at the Irish Centre. I think of particular friends I was with where we giggled so much that their knees gave way. Mm. Um Different moments, and it changes the different moments, and I spin them round, and almost um, they rain down on me like a shield. And then from behind, I think of my ancestor line, all my all my Irish and Indian relatives, and the gifts they gave me, good and bad, you know, like uh, blood pressure is in the family, but so is a gift for storytelling and stuff like that. Think of all the gifts they gave me, good and bad, and my ancestors and my tribe and my clan are looking on me, and... Um, their version of entertainment is the people that are currently living now here today. Like I am an extension of the people I've come from. So they are cheering me on. They're calling my name. And then I just imagine my go-to happy place, which is Don Angus on Inishmore, the biggest Aran Islands. There's a particular fort I used to hang out at. And um, I'm sitting in the grass, the long grass in summer. The sky is gorgeous. It's just all on my face. And then I, I kind of just, I kind of meditate for a few minutes this all lasts five minutes. It's one particular song I play on my ear pods while I do it. And then I kind of breathe that out. I'm good to go. I'm shielded. Nothing will land if any anyone comes for me. But also I've got the support of my memories, my humor, my ancestors, my happy place. Boom. Let's do this. How could you not smash a gig with all that? I, 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 that's unbelievable. And um, was that something the therapy taught you or was that something you read? Or? I kind of come to it naturally. I was reading books on like shamanism and Celtic druidic practices. Um, uh, so but, you need to define Celtic Druid apart <laughs> for me more than anyone else. Oh, so like, so the old, long before Christianity came, the belief systems of Ireland were very much nature based mm. um, and about ancestor stuff, your connection to your ancestors, which I really love because even to this day, <coughs> elements of here of it, like thinking of your grandparents that used to be with you or whatever. Um, but also just bringing in their power, their gift. Like Native Americans believe it's a song line. Like you are your ancestors and you have the journey. You are part of the journey. They are here. Others are here. You are part of the journey with the gifts that you've got doing the things you're going to do. So my own like kind of version really, but it just seemed to work and just made me feel, gosh, if tonight doesn't go well or someone throws a glass or the, the roof caves in, that's okay. I've done some grounding work to protect myself because you're being vulnerable. So I'm going to do 23 and me after and try to find <laughs> out if I can qualify for my Irish passport. <laughs> um, so also before the comedy you, you did, you still oh, do sorry, a just, lot of writing. Just yeah, on that, I was going to say, but like a version you could run with is like uh, taking a few minutes to yourself before you go on or before you leave the house, thinking about times people you respect have told you you're funny mm. because that will equip you with being resilient mm. against the rest of the stuff. You see what yeah. I mean? So that that one lad said he didn't think you were funny, but your your Aunt Mavis, who never laughs, loved that gig. That agent who wants you for a coffee, Voxel, who booked you for a mm. Thursday, that is your resilience against that bad stuff. Yeah, no, that's really it's powerful. Chill. And you can take it for different sort of realms as well. Yeah. Like, so that's yeah. really, really, really cool. Oh, realms, you're getting into it already. There we go. No, um... So before comedy, you did a lot of writing. You still do a lot of writing? I was working on historical fiction, and it was a project called The Last Empress of Calcutta, and agents were interested, and they sent me to festivals, and I got like this writing mentorship, and one of the Man Booker Prizes, which is a big award, for, um, judges were mentoring me. And I loved it. It's a lot of work, though, especially historical fiction. Mm. Oh, good Lord. I had to go to British Library, pouring through papers. Um, was really into it, but the writing was never easy. Like mm. I'd be up at 4 a.m. and be like... Do I use a semicolon there? I don't know. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? I was like yeah. at wit's end. Um, and then one day I just thought, do you know what? I can I can do writing at any age, even when I retire. I can, I can you know, because writing doesn't matter. Mm. But my personality is linked to comedy. Um, and I've got more energy now than I will have at 60. Mm. So I chose, I put writing to bed and I chose comedy. Um, but 
that background absolutely informs like i know some of the feedback i've had from judges and stuff they've talked about my wordsmith and like how i put sentences together and or i think there are phrases now that people have even said gosh i can see that on a t-shirt like our lady of perpetual indulgence or hell have no fury like a mm. gay man mildly offended i do love wordplay and mm. and the genetics of words so um um there is that and i am working on a sitcom at the moment so writing will come into it um and i wouldn't want necessarily I'd want to be part of my writing. I want to be in the thing I'd be in. And what's the writing process for the sitcom, similar to the comedy, where you're speaking it out loud with someone else, and then it gets documented? Or to some extent, that? I mean, some of my stand-up will come into it because I talk a lot about my pensioners in the stand-up. But um, yeah, I mean, you have to bring it to the base at some stage. You have to do the horrible side, you know, italics, this size, this. You know, you've got to do all that. I'm not walking around the kitchen going font eleven. <laughs> The assistant's coming. I can see them very soon. And um, type it up, please. Just have to tap. I do that when I use the, um, on Apple, when I use the, uh, uh, you know, the, the dictation function. Mm. I'm like, <laughs> comma, full stop, exclamation. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's a mixed approach. But I think if you're going to do dialogue well, and I think it's really important to do that, uh, especially with screenwriting, because it's mainly dialogue. Mm. Um, I think speaking it aloud brings a different natural dialogue that you don't get from sitting writing. Mm. Even things that you would say, like I wrote this piece about Magdalene Laundry Survivor and there was uh, people from Donegal and there were just isms that wouldn't come out were you at the desk. Mm. You wouldn't be like, oh, you know, you wouldn't be like, oh, come on, no way. Oh, listen, that yeah. just might not, you might not actively because it feels a little bit contrived. Yeah. But saying it aloud and doing like a, a head voice, it, it does. No, that sounds really powerful yeah. as well. For the characters. Um, and what really impressed me is because I struggle a lot with, say, I want to take on multiple projects at once, but you were able to say, no, I'll come back to like yeah. historical fiction in the future. Yeah. You think that's not, I don't think that's a very common thing to be able to sort of yeah. com compartmentalize or whatever. Yeah. So how have you, how, how do you think about that? Is there I, a great, is there a big plan or what's the... Yeah, I, what I really thought was about the business side of things, because the bottom line is writing isn't sexy <laughs> That's you know, fair. it's not about the yeah. personality like yeah. really generally um and loads of people retire at 60 and knock out a book and stuff like that and so you can come to that at any time there's not really linked to time mm -hmm. as much as where if you wanted to be a singer or, or model or do stand up um stand up less so but it is linked to you've got to be off a certain age mm -hmm. to hit the clubs you've got to, you've got to have the energy and the willpower and so i just thought now is right. Now I can come back to writing. But also, the minute I started writing stand-up, it was comedy. It was, it was so different from literary fiction. Mm -hmm. It was so easy. It was so easy. I feel like I was um, just peeling back the layer and the, and the writing was there. Mm -hmm. As where with, with novels and short stories... I, I liked the end result and people liked it, but the route there was just painful. You're on the right way now, so it's more yeah, of the other yeah. sort of analogy or whatever. Yeah. No, so I think think about the business and the reality. That's the mm. bottom line. Like, you know, if 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 someone, you know, you have to look at the business. You know. Mm. But anyway, Dean, um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, what you. are you going to do for the rest of your day? Uh, after this, I am going to. Um, chat to some of the lovely staff here at Voxel because I know them, and then I'm going to a flotation tank. Wow which is nice. Please explain a flotation type. So it's going to be like a big egg-like cocoon. They play nice music, probably Enya. There's going to be candles, Yulang Yulang. There'll be someone in reception that speaks like, hi, hi, my name's Florence Happiness. Um, and I'm going to be putting a massive like egg-like thing, at hot water full of salt, like two tons of Epsom salt, and you float. Mm -hmm. um, and you're in the dark, and it's just really relaxing. You can hear your heartbeat. It's meant to emulate being in your mother's stomach, I think, isn't it? Wow. But um, I'd heard a lot about it. I did my first session a few weeks back, and I felt so relaxed. When I lifted my arm up out of the water, I was like, well, I have to carry that now. <laughs> it's ridiculous that way. I felt so relaxed. There's a relaxation room afterwards. Um, so I got free session, three sessions. So, um, yeah. Um, thought, what are you thinking when you're in the tank? Well, now, to be honest... <laughs> The first session, I was too hyper. I was too into it. I was like, oh my God, I'm like a mermaid. I'm thinking today's session will be relaxing. My first one, I was just, because I'm six foot two. It's not often I am in a space where I can float. So I was just like enjoying the fun of that little mermaid aerial realness. But today I've decided I've organized myself so that I'm going to be relaxed. I I hope it goes really yeah. well. I love to listen to my heartbeat though. And just kind of, it was darkness, a little bit space like. But my powers didn't come in yet. So uh, I'm going to do that. <laughs> they will come. They, they will, will come. come. They and will then come. I've got a gig in Soho tonight. So I'm going to try out uh, a new song 
and then hopefully tweak something about that. Let me see with the audience. And then um, Friday, I start some tour support for Sir Tom Allen. So, yeah. Well, well, well good luck with the gig, not that you need it at all. And good luck with the tour support as well, oh, which is amazing. You. And yes, thank you for coming. And thank for you. everyone that can follow Dean at Dean Comedian. And yeah, please reach out with any feedback and subscribe or follow. And I appreciate it. Feedback for you. I yes, feedback. Dean feedback. does not need any yeah. feedback whatsoever. In fact, <laughs> don't talk to him. He is beyond at all. <laughs> no, it's not all. that. There'll be lists. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be lists. I will take the feedback. My mother will. <laughs> she's, she's ready. Like, Finally, we I get the opportunity. Want to give you the satisfaction, Reese? But I find <laughs> some of those angles were not friendly. He looks like a Christmas gammon. <laughs> Thanks very much, dude. Ah, cheers. Uh.